Good morning, and uh, can I welcome everybody to the third meeting of the uh, Public Audit Committee in this session of Parliament. Uh, can I begin by reminding everybody about the Parliament's rules on social distancing uh, and also the requirement to wear face masks if you are moving around the room or entering or leaving the room. Um, the first item on our agenda is to agree to uh, take items three and four in private. Is that agreed? Thank you. The main purpose of uh, this morning's session is to uh, look at the report which was brought out in March of this year uh, jointly by the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission, uh, a Section 23 report which looked at improving outcomes uh, for young people through school education. And um, I am delighted once again to welcome the Auditor General who is here with us in person this morning uh, and also there are uh, three uh, of his colleagues who worked on the report who are joining us uh, via video link. Um, Anthony Clark, who's the Interim Director of Performance Audit and Best Value. Uh, Tricia Meldrum, who's a Senior Audit Manager. And Zoe Maguire, who's a Senior Auditor uh, in perform Performance Audit and Best Value. So welcome uh, to all four of you. Um, we've got uh, quite a number of questions uh, to put this morning, but before we do that, um, Auditor General, I wonder whether you could give us a brief introductory statement. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Members. Today I bring to the Committee a report on improving outcomes through school education. The report reflects the findings of our work up to the start of the pandemic in March 2020 which we supplemented with additional audit work last year to report on the impact of COVID-19 upon school education. Our report was published in March 2021 and our findings predate both the publication of the OECD review um, of Curriculum for Excellence in June of this year and the Scottish Government's response to its findings. In presenting the report, I of course wish to acknowledge the commitment and efforts of those working in education, as well as those of our children and young people, their parents and carers during this most challenging time. Can be as important as they are, Scotland's exam system is about more than exam results. Education policy and the curriculum reflect the importance of different pathways and wider outcomes, such as improving health and wellbeing. Children and young people have access to more opportunities and increasingly achieve more of the wider awards and qualifications available to them than they did in 2014 when we last reported on this topic. The Scottish Government's two priorities for school education are to raise attainment for all and to close the poverty-related attainment gap. Nationally, exam performance and other attainment measures have improved since 2013-14, but the rate of improvement up to 2018-19 has been inconsistent across different measures. There is wide variation in performance across the country with evidence of worsening performance on some measures in some councils. We recognise the complexity of closing the poverty-related attainment gap, but it remains wide and progress towards it falls short of the Scottish Government's aims. Improvement needs to happen faster and more consistently across Scotland to address the inequalities which existed before COVID-19 and have increased as a result. Convener, there's a lack of data to address some wider measures of outcomes that are priorities, such as wellbeing. Between 13-14 and 2018-19, funding on school education increased more than for other council services. Most of the real terms increases in council education spending came from the Attainment Scotland Fund. The Scottish Government has now committed to spend a further £1 billion in this parliamentary session on closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Children and young people's learning well-being and economic circumstances have been adversely affected by COVID-19, with those living in the most challenging circumstances hit hardest. Regardless of the nature of the structural changes in education that come from the government's response to the OECD review, it should focus on building coordination and good collaboration that help deliver a rapid improvement in outcomes across the country. Convener, as always, my colleagues and I will be delighted to answer the committee's questions this morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Auditor General. Um, I'd like to begin um, because I think um, this week you've made an important 
uh, statement uh, in a blog which uh, reflects on 10 years since the Christie Commission was uh, produced. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind me quoting you, because I think it's important that these are uh, on the record, you warned that the country, in your words, remains riven by inequalities. Uh, but you also said that um, it remains the case that there is a major implementation gap, a major implementation gap between policy ambitions and delivery on the ground. And with reference to this morning's uh, inquiry, uh, you said that uh, progress on closing the poverty-related attainment gap between the most and least deprived school pupils had been limited. Limited. So that's a very powerful statement of how you see things. So I wonder whether you want to reflect on that and, and perhaps outline for us uh, what you think needs to change uh, so that that huge, major implementation gap you spoke about can be closed. Thank you very much, Convener. And um, I'll maybe start, actually, but I'll perhaps invite Anthony Clark to come in as well, just about some of the wider reflections that we want to do across our work in its entirety. Um, yes, I, I took the opportunity uh, this week um, in a blog to reflect some of the progress that Scotland had made 10 years on from the Christie Commission and its drive to deliver improved outcomes for Scotland, focusing on preventative spend and better collaboration across our public services. We make reference in, in that blog to um, the inequalities that exist across the country and draw on aspects of the report findings that, um, that we have before the committee today. Um, and in particular, um, a number of themes in, in that blog that we touch on that um, as to reflecting on why Christie hadn't delivered um, its stated ambitions um, and hypothesised that aspects of that may be due to um, the austerity that um, the country um, faced um, after the financial crisis, the lack of incentives for leaders, but also broadening that out to look at um, we, in many ways, perform to what we're being asked to measure against as being one of the inhibitors for um, delivering change and delivering progress. Convener, we also talk about the lack of robust data and milestones and again, it's not a new theme for Audit Scotland and it's reporting our, our 2018 report on planning for outcomes. Again, emphasise the importance of uh, when policy implementation to set clear milestones, have the right data so that scrutineers, um, those charged with delivering the implementation of policy, can track, monitor, tweak, adjust towards progress. And in one of our key findings in today's report is that um, there's a lack of robust data to measure against um, the broader aspects of Scottish education system. Um, so there is um, plenty of data and perhaps, as we suggest in the report, uh, an overt focus on attainment levels within schools, so uh, and in respect of exam results, but not that broader sense that it's accepted of that school is about more than just exam results. Um, so we saw today's... Um, report and also the blog is to um, assist in that conversation of, of refocusing what we need to do as a country to ultimately achieve that outcome of better outcomes, tackling inequality and broadening it opportunity. I hope that's a, a reasonable reflection, Camila, but I'm sure Anthony will, will have a few words to say to supplement mine. Thank you very much, Auditor General, and good morning, convener and committee. I think I broadly agree with what the Auditor General is saying. It seems to us that the Scottish Government and Councils now need to focus on addressing the impact of COVID-19 in terms of disadvantaged groups. It's very clear that as uh, the Scottish Government and COSLA have started to plan for education recovery, they've been very committed, I think, to putting addressing inequality at the heart of what they're doing. That will be difficult, though, and it will require, I think, concerted effort across a number of different fronts. Firstly, there's a role of education authorities in providing leadership, scrutiny and challenge. The Auditor General has already mentioned that. There's an important role for the regional improvement collaboratives, I think, to work with education authorities and schools to gather data, use data and understand what's making a difference in improving outcomes. And the Scottish Government also has an important leadership role. This is something that will involve effort by everybody over an extended period of time. As the report made clear, addressing inequalities and closing the attainment gap is not something that can happen quickly. But I think if people do the things we see in our report, we could hope to see steady progress over time that will address this, this long-standing challenge. 
Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Clark and Auditor General. Uh, w one of the things that um, uh, that is mentioned in the report, which I think um, uh, Mr. Boyle, you referred to earlier on, is uh, that question of data. And I think if I read paragraph 25 of the report, it seems to me to put it very starkly uh, when it says that, and I quote, the Scottish Government's national aim is to improve outcomes for all, but it, it has not set out by how much or when. I mean, from an auditing, auditing's perspective, uh, that sounds like quite a major flaw, isn't it? And, and indeed, Kavina, that's one of the, the main conclusions and recommendations that we make in the report, that in order to deliver across um, the aims of Curriculum for Excellence and the, the National Improvement Framework, there has to be a consistent application of robust data so that for all the reasons that we set out in the report and, and I've touched on already this morning, that uh, to have effective milestones that allows policymakers to um, assess and monitor progress and take any remedial action as necessary is a key part of it has to be built upon robust data across not just one but all four aspects um, of the, the intentions of the, the curriculum. Right, thank you. And uh, we will return to some of these themes uh, during the course of, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, morning's session. Um, I, the, the report, as you stated at the beginning, uh, takes us up to January 2021, and obviously quite a lot has happened uh, since uh, that time. I just wonder whether you have been able to gather any more information about where things now are uh, and uh, whether you've been able to understand whether some of the actions uh, that were recommended in your report, for example, have been uh, followed up at uh, a central and local government level. So I'll, I'll maybe um, start, convener, and I'll invite um, Tr uh, Trisha Meldrum uh, to come in and say a little bit more about the updated data. I think one of the points that, that if I say first of all, is that, um, and caveating what <clears throat> my introductory remarks is that, um, Scottish exam system, Scottish education system, pardon me, is not just about exams, but in light of the disruption caused by COVID, um, we have now have two years of data gaps, co um, as that based on the comparable arrangements that existed um, with SQA assessments. Um, we we have, as many others have tracked, the implications of some of the the teacher assessment led aspect of of data. Uh, and Trisha can say a bit more about that. But I guess it, more widely in terms of you know, government's response, Education Scotland's response and local authorities' response, which we make recommendations to all three uh, parties in the report. Um, we have, as, we, as you would expect, convener, we uh, clear the report and we make recommendations. And it's something that we'll continue to follow up on through our work in future uh, to assess progress. Um, as you also mentioned, however, the fact that there is potentially such significant change pending to the Scottish education system, I think we'll want to take stock to make sure that our recommendations, which we think will hold the test of time, but review and who will be best placed to implement those recommendations, and we'll do that through the course of our and report back to the committee as necessary. Uh, but Trisha can say a little bit more about what we've seen of the more recent data since we published. Thank you. you to address us. Okay. Well, I think, can we, um, I think, is your microphone on or off? Tricia. Okay. Is it possible to put the microphone on from this end? I think I've done it from my end. Ah, right. Yeah. Excellent. You are with us. Tricia Meldrum, come in. Would you like to supplement what the Auditor General has said? Thank you. Hi. Morning. Sorry about that. Um, yes, in relation to the updated data, so there's obviously been um, two sets of um, assessments since then. And two lots of results that have come out in August time. And what we have seen is obviously quite a different picture to, to what we have reported in the report. And the method of assessment has obviously been different in relation to that being largely based on teachers' assessment 
um, and, and some of the um, testing that went on this year to inform the, the teachers' assessment. So we see quite a different picture in terms of the data, in terms of quite large improvements in relation to the pass rate compared to previous years, um, and also the narrowing of the, of the attainment gap as well. Um, but obviously it's difficult to compare what's happened in, in the last two years with what happened previously. One of the other key measures in the, the National Improvement Framework and one of the key outcomes that the Scottish Government is, is seeking to um, address is around participation. So that being around the status of 16 to 19 year olds, are they in, um, are they in education, are they in further higher education, are they in work training, etc. And again, participation rates have improved over the, over the last couple of years. So, so yes, um, and we're seeing a reduction in the number of people who are unknown, which is a good thing as well. So previously there were a number of 16 to 19 year olds where the data wasn't able to track them to know what their destination was. That has reduced, and we're seeing also that more more young people are in a positive destination. And um, so, a few things in relation to the data there, and um, obviously in relation to to wider um, progress against our recommendations, we're continuing to to talk to the Scottish government. Um, but that's that's a bit of an update on where the where the data is sitting. Thank you. Um, before I um, widen the question out, there was just one other uh, thing I wanted to uh, come back to, which. Um, again was mentioned in the opening presentation and that is the OECD report uh, which came out in I think June of this year so just a couple of months after uh, your own report uh, was produced uh, but you, you, I think in the briefing note for today's committee meeting you say that there are some common themes between the conclusions uh, you arrived at and the conclusions and recommendations made by the uh, OECD so I wonder whether it would be uh, useful for us, I think, to hear from you uh, what those uh, uh, common themes are and uh, whether there are uh, clear recommendations that come from those common themes that would uh, do what the report says we need to do and I think what, the, the thing that we are all agreed on, which is about improving outcomes, in a broader sense, improving outcomes for young people through school education. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think our, our assessment of the, the comparability of our own report to that of the OECD is that there are um, consistencies and synergies uh, between the two reports. Um, and I'd probably point to the theme I think we've explored um, a little bit already this morning about that, the, the quality of data um, across all the pillars of the Scottish education system that exists um, and the need for that to improve we, we've touched on the fact that the exam system, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but um, is um, very data-led, but that's not replicated on the other aims of Scottish education. And we see that in, in both reports. We'd also acknowledge the, the OECD report, which talked about the, the, those wider aims of curriculum for excellence, um, embedding in the broad general education element of the um, the curriculum, but then not reflecting into the um, the senior phase, and we see also that coming through in the, the more recent updated OECD report too. So from our perspective, it, it's that consistent thread through this report, our earlier reporting on planning for outcomes, and the need for improved um, planning data to deliver outcomes most effectively. Um, as, of, as others, you know, we await the um, the full confirmation of the government's plans, what that means for the structure of Scottish education system. But I maybe refer back to the comment I made in my introductory remarks is that really regardless of whatever structure is implemented in the Scottish education system, that it doesn't um, lose sight of the overall objective of delivering better outcomes uh, for Scotland's children and young people, particularly as we've seen how badly affected um, our most deprived communities have been over the course of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. I do want now to open out uh, questioning to the uh, uh, to the whole committee, and I want to start with uh, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning again, Auditor General. I wonder if I could just uh, ask you to tell us a little bit more about the response to COVID and the part that remote learning and digital technology played in that. Your your message is very complimentary, I think, and recognising that there was a strong foundation there already. But could you give us your perspective of how, how well that worked? 
Yeah, that, uh, morning, Mr. Coffey. Happy to do that. Actually, and I'll, I'll again invite colleagues to supplement my response. I think uh, Zoe Maguire is probably the best place to come in just to talk about the kind of nature of the, the, the leadership arrangements and, and the COVID response. Um, there is one of the findings in our, our report is that the Scottish education system worked well and worked collaboratively both before the pandemic and in the response um, from the education system during the course of the pandemic uh, in extremely challenging circumstances as we, you know, we all lived through and experienced in, in many different sectors. We make reference to the work of the COVID education recovery group, the representation from many different uh, parties within that group, the 10 work streams um, that were placed in it. Um, and then we also refer to um, the allocation of resources to public bodies to um, take steps to ensure that online learning, as, we, as many of us recall, um, was made available um, to Scotland's children and young people and the allocation of 50,000 devices uh, that took place by uh, December of last year. Um, which, you know, which, of course, is many months after the, the pandemic started. Um, but I think it's also fair to recognise that although that inevitably there would have been digital exclusion for some of Scotland's children and young people and hardship experienced, um, that the provision of such a complex uh, process in a competitive market, you know, so there were businesses, people switching to home working overnight, organisations across the country trying to access a limited supply of digital devices, and education providers trying to do likewise, all led to a, you know, difficult circumstances. Um, so in overall, I think it's, it's fair to say that we think the system worked well in very challenging circumstances to deliver it. Um, that would be my assessment, Mr Coffey, but I'm sure but Zoe can give us a little bit more detail about, um, over and above what we see um, in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. I ju just to echo, really, I think that we, um, with the setting up of the, the COVID education recovery group relatively quickly was a, was a really good thing and really acted as an advisory group and helped to pull together specific things around specific work streams, so workforce and um, those with um, more complex learning needs um, really kind of helped to, to, um, to pull things together and, and provide really good advice um, the system um, and so we saw that happen quickly um, although I think later on in, in the, um, the setting up of the group was a, a youth panel I think that was put in place at around, I think it was around October uh, last year so that was put in place a little bit later um, and as the Auditor General said with the, um, the distribution of remote devices I think that happened um, uh, relatively quickly and under some difficult circumstances um, but uh, um, um, was very much kind of targeted to those who initially needed them uh, for, for um, issues of, of deprivation and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you pick up any um, disproportionate impact on on young young people that uh, perhaps learning from school? I mean, the device uh, from home, I should say. The device is one thing, isn't it, to have a device handy, but the data connection speed from your house is entirely another one, and we've all had various experiences of that, even in the, the Parliament. So, did you did you pick up on any issues there that that we might want to learn a few lessons from? Uh, if should something like this happen again, yeah, it's a really important point, Mr. Coffey. Actually, that our ability to work and learn from home <clears throat> is, of course, based on our home circumstances, and those you know are unique to ourselves. So one is the factor is, of course, the availability of a device to allow us to access learning. The other aspect will be the, you know, the ability in this context of the school to be able to you know, provide lessons, to, to set work and so forth. And then back in the home environment, you know, whether it's broadband, whether there's a, a space to work, whether there's parental care or support to support learning are all factors. Um, as we mentioned in, in the report that we conducted some uh, focus groups and, and again the team can say a little bit more about this in, in a moment. We also drew on survey results that reflected young people's experiences of home learning and, and I think it's, it's safe to say that young people found that challenging There are and particularly some groups, I think we make reference in the report to um, uh, girls finding that, that harder than, than boys um, and the, that context of um, this being a very challenging environment and a fluid environment as well, uncertainty, all of it contributed to, to really difficult context. Um, I'll ask 
Zoe again, just to come in and say a little bit more about kind of the survey nature and our own focus group and what the children and young people we spoke to and, and how they conveyed their experiences. Yes, yeah, thank you. That, that's a very interesting point you pick up around connectivity. I think that was definitely an issue we found. It's not just about the device, it's about exactly that, having the connectivity. And also just to be honest, having the space, having the, the space within your home um, to, to be able to do that work um, because of circumstances around your, your family and home situation might make it difficult for, for young people. That's what we were hearing um, uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, actually having a desk to work at or a space with people in the home and things and just distractions like that. Um, and we definitely found through some of the, the survey results and through some of our own talking to, to children and young people um, that there was a lot of um, anxiety as well around around not knowing quite what was going to happen, uh, around what it was knowing was going to happen around exams. Um, so we definitely heard a fair bit around that anxiety. Although to, to counter that, it wasn't that wasn't a kind of blanket um, situation for all children and young people. We did hear of some young people who, who actually um, thrived and, and quite enjoyed that environment and being able to spend a bit more time with their families. But that very much did, did depend on you know having the right things in, in, in place um, and and also having. Um, I think it very much depended on the, the school and the teacher. It was um, how comfortable the, the teacher felt with doing digital learning. Obviously, that was a very new thing for, for teachers as well. So, so there was a real kind of variation of an experience with children and young. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Lastly, on that point, convener, do you think we'll keep any element of this remote learning, Stephen, as we go forward, or will we go back to, to normal and have everybody in school? And do you think will we lose the advantages that the remote learning gave us, or will we go back? We, we touched on in the report, Mr Coffey, that um, probably recognising the differences between the first lockdown and the second lockdown and the additional role that Education Scotland undertook to coordinate the response across um, education providers uh, in Scotland. Um, we also make a recommendation in the report that, um, and, and we're conscious of our remit here, I should say, actually, that it will be for education providers, Scottish Government and Education Scotland, um, to draw those assessments of how they wish to uh, determine how education is provided in Scotland. Uh, nonetheless, you know, I would acknowledge that uh, if there are any benefits that we've seen through the past 18 months that, that we can harness, whether it's in, in better preparedness for any future lockdowns or indeed that opportunity to harness any of the positive experiences that Zoe refers to, then we should of course do so and capture that in any future arrangements. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Camille. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, Anthony Clark wanted to come in on uh, this area as well with a, a, a few points. So I'll, I'll invite um, Anthony to, um, uh, to come in now. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I, I wanted, if I may, just to, to approach this point from a slightly different angle. I know Mr. Coffey is very interested in the technology support that children and families have in their home. It, I think the committee might be interested in the, the other side of the coin, which is the technological support available from local authorities. I think what we've found in our audit work of local authorities during the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been that those authorities that had invested in ICT technology over time were better prepared and better placed to pivot to different types of home-based learning and different types of uh, online service delivery to their, their local citizens. So I think the pandemic shone a spotlight on the importance of local authorities continuing to invest in ICT so that they can, so that they can provide different types of support for, for people moving forward. I leave open the question as to whether or not hybrid learning will be part of the learning offering in the future. But if it is, it clearly makes a point that local authorities need to have good technological kit in place to support that. I thought that might be useful for you to hear, Mr. Coffey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, can I now turn to um, Sharon Dowie, who's got um, a series of questions to, uh, to ask? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr. Boyle. Um, in its key audit themes report, the Session 5 Committee expressed its concern that a number of the audit reports had revealed that data and outcomes in relation to key service provision was incomplete or absent. Can you tell us the extent to which the less consistent and robust data in the NIF on wider outcomes has impacted your ability to measure the impact of the NIF and whether or not it is delivering value for money? Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Dowie. Yeah, delighted to start on that action. Again, I'll invite <clears throat> Trisha Meldrum or, or, um, and, and Anthony Clark, I'm sure, 
uh, to say a few words in addition. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Absolutely, one of the key findings we we have in the report is um, that there um, isn't a broad enough suite of data to measure the four um, kind of the aims of, of the curriculum. Um, we, if, if I may, we also actually think there's is more than just d data. We think there's an element of kind of tone and commentary around that, that skews some of that as well. Um, and we make reference in the report to what we consider to be in the feedback that we've received from across uh, education practitioners is that there's an overt tone and focus on exam results as being the measure that it, that matters most about how well a school uh, is providing, uh, is performing, I should say. <clears throat> Nonetheless, if there's a, a broad uh, acceptance that school is about more than exams, that's not reflected in the data and the associated milestones that go along with it. So we see that there is um, data absolutely on the attainment and exam performance, but then that's not reflected sufficiently um, in other aspects of the curriculum and the, the objectives, health and wellbeing in particular. Um, so we, that comes out as a key theme and judgment that we make in the report, that there needs to be that parity of uh, quality data milestones in order to demonstrate and evidence that consistency across the, the, the core themes of the report. And as you say, Ms. Dow, it's not a new uh, theme that neither uh, your successor committee nor Audit Scotland has commented on our own planning for outcomes report, the committee's legacy report, and many of the reports that the committee considered in its last session touched on this important point about there needing to be clear, robust data to measure um, the, and the delivery towards that, that rounded suite of outcomes that we want for education. Okay, thanks. Just you're saying the rounded suite. Um, just on that, for the exam results, there's been a lot of talk of doing in the, the exam results. So what were your, what's your thoughts on whether we keep exams or whether we were to get rid of them? I think... I think that's probably a question that's the best commented on by um, education providers. I think I'm, I'm clear that it, on my remit and, and that of Audit Scotland um, that we and we kind of best stick to kind of what we know. I think that how the Scottish education curriculum is delivered in future, I, I say, is one that's perhaps best for uh, the government and education to determine. What we would say though is that. Um, in order to evidence and to measure how schools are performing the experience of children and young people at schools is that data goes beyond exams and, and into those wider suite. But in terms of the specifics of whether we sh should or shouldn't have exams, I'd probably refer that to others if, if you forgive me. So would it affect your reliability to judge the attainment within the schools? Would it have a large <coughs> impact, small impact? I'm, I'm not sure if, if it does necessarily, because I think, I think we've seen over the past couple of years, if it's determined by a policy decision that um, attainment is measured either through teacher assessments, school assessments, or some other vehicle through exams, and if that's the, the basis upon which Scottish education is determined, then, then we would follow that data rather than uh, determining what the policy would be, which is clearly outside of our remit. Okay, your report states that the Scottish Government, councils and their partners need to build on the work already undertaken to agree clear priorities for education recovery and improved outcomes after COVID-19. Are you aware of any action taken in relation to how these responsible, those responsible will ensure that the NIF outcomes will be measured, reported and acted on? I, I think, again, I'm going to invite colleagues to come in, actually, just to track the, the progress of what's happened uh, since we reported. And I'll maybe first turn to uh, Anthony Clark and then Tricia, uh, if she wishes to add anything afterwards. Thank you, Auditor General. Uh, I, I think the answer to your question, Sharon, is that this is all being picked up in the Scottish Government's response to the OECD report, which is clearly trying to make sure there's better alignment between the um, National Improvement Framework and Curriculum for Excellence, both of which are designed to improve outcomes and address inequalities. So the actions are being taken forward through the response to the OECD. Okay, and just to pick up on something that Ms Meldrum had said earlier on, um, 
do you think we've got a robust enough system to follow those that cho choose to leave school at 16 to ensure that they've got positive outcomes and they don't fall through the cracks? And what more could we do? I would, <clears throat> in terms of Trisha's response, what I would add is, um, like many others, we'll be interested to follow through on the young person's guarantee, which probably feels like that will um, be the embodiment of how... Um, the positive destinations will be determined and, and following through in the data. Again, it goes back to data, you know, about that through the, the arrangements that the government has committed to uh, for post-school education for Scotland's children and young people, that that's set in the, the targets, what's actually achieved, uh, and it's something we'll closely monitor and consider for future reporting through our audit work. Okay. I don't know whether, Tricia Meldrum, do you, you want to come in on those uh, questions which um, Sharon Dowie put. Yep, thank you. Can you hear me this time? Yes. Yep. yep, okay. I think one of the points we make in the report is around the different pathways that are available to, to young people and so potentially so all their, all their learning doesn't necessarily have to take place in schools so that broader range of opportunities being available through colleges and we see an increase quite a, quite a significant increase in the number of young people under 16 who are doing some learning at college and also more work around foundation apprenticeships so more young people again working with employers um, as part of their learning so we do see some increases there and and, and quite significant quite big increases, numbers still quite small, but quite big increases over the last few years in terms of these pathways being available. Again, our point is that's that's not very well um, picked up through through the data, focusing on examinations, so not necessarily picking up some of these vocational qualifications. They're not part of the key indicators. They're, they don't get the same, and um, they're not given perhaps the same kind of focus as some of the exam results. And again, talking to, to some of the young people and hearing about some of their challenges, so, so the, perhaps that feeling of, of those other choices not having the same um, parity of esteem, perhaps, as being on at school and studying for your hires and studying for advanced hires. So, so trying to kind of um, make sure that whatever happens in the future, that those different pathways do have that parity of esteem and that, again, that is reflected in the data and is reflected in the, in the scrutiny of, of the whole education system. Thank you. I think a lot of kids are starting to see now that there are benefits of other things other than higher education, going on to other destinations, apprenticeships, etc. So I think that message is getting through. I'm more kind of looking at is there enough data to make sure that if somebody leaves school when they're 16, are we actually following the child to make sure that they have went to a positive outcome and they haven't fell through a crack and they don't have a job or the apprenticeships fell through? Is somebody following them right through to make sure that we're, we're seeing where the child's going to make sure they don't fall through the cracks? I, I we'd agree with this. It's a hugely Apologies, Trisha. I'll, I'll maybe go first and then invite Trisha to come in in a second. I, I agree that, that that quality of of data and tracking really matters. Even stepping back from the very significant investment that Scotland makes in its in you know, its future workforce, effectively and, and skills and the important role that you know children and young people will play um, across uh, all aspects of Scotland's you know future life and, and prosperity. Um, in terms of our own work, I would maybe point to that we're, on, we're currently undertaking some um, audit work on the investing in skills arena within in Scotland and how well that works, looking at the, um, the success of apprenticeship arrangements, foundation apprenticeships, modern apprenticeships, um, and how well Scotland's skills system works together, the role of Skills Development Scotland, Scottish Funding Council and so forth and, and we'll be reporting on that uh, early in 2022 that will, but as well as our own work, we'd also agree that, um, and again, that, that theme of data um, matters and indeed that you know, for those organisations that, that are involved in it, that they're reporting transparently about how well um, our post-school system is working that the positive destinations that are, we're committed to uh, are being achieved. So work for us to report on that, but very much the case that, you know, for Scotland's skills bodies, our local authorities and the government to report on that progress too. Um, thanks, Kavira. I'll maybe hand over again to Tricia. Thank you. I was just going to say, 
was just going to come back on the, the question around the, the data on the 16 to 19 year olds. So that's the participation data set. Um, and that would be the main way that you would know what's happening to, to 16 year olds. Um, so there has been quite a lot of work gone into actually improving that data set in relation to reducing the number of young people who are um, with an unknown classification. So the last data that just came out a couple of weeks ago, that was down to 4.6%. So it had previously been up at over, over 5%, 6%, 6% um, and quite different again across different councils. And we, we know that councils themselves and schools and Skills Development Scotland have been putting a lot of work into trying to reduce the number of unknowns. And um, because if they're unknown, those, those young people are potentially um, don't know what's happening to them in terms of what their destination is. Um, and we know also that there's lots of work going on within councils and schools to really improve the positive destinations for their children and young people. So really focusing on the potential trajectory for these children and young people. What might they be going to college, might they be going to university, might they be going into training, etc. And really working with the young people around, around the best outcomes for them. So we, had, we did see lots of examples of that at, at local level around really improving participation um, and, and that positive outcome at that 16 to 19 age bracket. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think that's been uh, that's been a very useful uh, session. Can I now turn to um, Colin Beatty, who I think has got um, a number of questions which he wants to put around outcomes, Mr. Beatty. Thank you, Convener. General, um, looking at the report overall, it seems a, a pretty positive report. But of course, being the Public Audit Committee, we have to focus on the the negative bits. Um, key message four, page five of the report, says there's a, a wide variation of educational performance across councils, and that's in terms of declining performance against indicators and also where there has been improvements. Thinking back to previous discussions that we've had around this table, are you satisfied that the indicators and the way they're, um, the way they're uh, what do you call it, filled, for want of a better word, uh, by councils, the way they're put together by councils, constructed by councils, are directly compa comparable across the whole council scene? I'll, um, I'll maybe start, actually, but I'm going to invite Anthony Clark to come in relatively swiftly um, on, on this point. Um, the, in terms of, if I may, just talk about, the, I guess the comparability um, of councils um, is, di is difficult to do, and I think we touched on in the report because of wide variation of factors. That you know, no, no two councils are exactly the same, depending on their geography, their level of poverty, rural rurality in the council, the number of teachers that, that they employ, the distances that children and young people have to, to travel to school, and then of course all of the factors that we touched on, uh, Mr. Coffey, about the, the individual home circumstances that children will so all contribute to the ability with which to compare one council uh, to another. If you're looking at a surely the elements that go into populating that are the same in every council, and if they're not, then they're not comparable. In terms of the comparability of, of the data and how it's compiled, yes, our, it's our understanding that they are populated on the same basis, so that every authority will be measuring the same question that's been asked of them, yes. So much of the... The, the vari the, so the variation must be directly comparable between councils in spite of variations as to the number of teachers and all the other things, the indicators themselves should be robust. So, so again, Anthony may wish to comment. I said but we've no reason and there's nothing that came out in our audit work that suggests that there was any flaw in the data that's been presented. Then, leading on from that, given that there's a number of uh, um, councils that uh, where indicators have gone gone the wrong way. Are there any indications looking across the, the board of a common denominator? Is it to schools that are mostly uh, functioning in more deprived areas? Is, is, there, is there any sort of social element in this? Is there, any, is there any physical element in this? Is there anything we can point to and say, ah, that's the cause that these indicators are going down in that place? Again, I'll, I'll say one or two very brief words, and I'm sure Anthony will want to come in, actually. In, in the report, that we also comment on 
I guess some of the factors on, and investment factors that have gone into local authorities, the attainment challenge, the very significant investment that's happened over the life of the previous parliament and the commitment um, that has gone on in, from the Scottish Government to councils over the course of this parliament. Um, and what we weren't able to do is to draw any kind of clear conclusions that that money um, had universally led to improvement in outcomes for the indicators that, that have been measured. Um, very significant investment, and that's one of the re key recommendations that we make in the report, that for this, as this is going to continue, that it's clear what uh, is intended to be achieved. And, and we've seen many evaluation reports, interim evaluation reports, undertaken by Education Scotland, and no doubt many examples of terrific practice of how that money has been used. But that's not borne out in the data, if we're kind of really stepping back at a high level about you know, what its impact is having. But I think it's probably in, enough from you and local authorities, Mr Beatty, and maybe hand over to, to Anthony just to kind of to broaden that out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Beatty. It's a very interesting question that you ask. Firstly, just to confirm what the Auditor General said, we have no concerns really about the quality and reliability and consistency of the data that's available. And great care is taken by the Scottish Government and local authorities to make sure there is consistency of approach. In our report, we talked about some experimental data that was being developed. I think the Scottish Government and others are always very clear to test data before it's made publicly available. And the data we report here is, is, is to the standard of the, the Office of National Statistics. As at the heart of your question is, what's causing this variability of performance? So, and it seems to us that there are a whole host of factors that bear on this. Some of it is to do with the different types of communities that the local authorities serve. Some more deprived communities, some more affluent communities is a factor. As the Auditor General has said, the level of investment that local authorities have made in education services will be a factor as well. There are very specific issues to do with the quality of leadership and the quality of teaching within schools. So there's no one single thing that can be, can be singled out as being the thing that makes a difference in terms of improving educational outcomes. You will notice from the report that some of the attainment challenge authorities are improving well. They're obviously the more disadvantaged educational authorities. Others are performing less well and in some ways are deteriorating. Conversely, we have some relatively affluent local authorities that are performing well, but equally some affluent authorities performing less well. So poverty and deprivation is not the whole story. We also say in the report that there's no clear causal link between levels of investment and outcomes as well. So this is a very complicated picture. And I think what I would say is much more needs to be done within the education system to better understand what it is that's making a difference on the ground. And that's the role for regional improvement collaboratives. That's the role for educational authorities. And there's a role for the Scottish Government too, in terms of identifying and sharing good practice across the system. This is a very complicated area. Perhaps I'm being too simplistic here, but it seems to me that if you have indicators, you have all the data that's going into these indicators, all the different aspects uh, on a comparable basis between councils, if you have a number of councils where they have declining indicators, there must be something in common there. If you look across the board, there must be something that you can put your finger on and say, this is, this, this, is, this is the most common factor in each case. Do you not possible to, to, to approach it in quite that way, Mr Beattie? Um, we've reported data at both national level and local authority level. Had we looked at the performance within individual education authorities, you'd also see quite wide variation within and across schools as well. So there are many, many factors that impact on positive or less positive performance. And as I say, it's really important, I think, that the education system the Scottish Government, RICS and education authorities, educational leaders work together to better understand what's actually causing those positive outcomes and the less positive outcomes. This is very much a live debate, I think, within the education system at the moment. I don't know whether Tricia wants to add anything to what I've just said. Uh, she can nod if she doesn't want to. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add was that was, was that point around factors that impact on outcomes for, for children and young people don't sit totally within, if you like, the control of the education system. So it's very much around how people working in, in education are working with their partners externally as well. So we talk in the report around links with health, with social work and with third, se with third sector partners as well. And also, obviously, very important, the, the families, the, par the parents, the carers, um, but it's how schools, councils, RICs are working, um, and, and also at national level, how 
organisations that are working across different parts of the public sector around the needs of the children and young people. So again, a very, very complex picture, but we're very, very aware that the things that impact on outcomes are not all just things that happen within schools and within the school setting. They very much um, relate to, to other parts of the public sector as well. It seems to me that indicators are there to inform and guide us as to future investment, uh, future focus on uh, on uh, where we put uh, resources. If the current indicators do not do that, however comparable they might be, however accurate they might be, is there a case that we need different indicators in order to extract more detailed information or more cogent information that will allow us to take those decisions? Can is I, that possible? Yeah, can I, yeah I, I, I'll maybe start again. Antony probably wants to come in and say a word or two as well. Um, I think that we would recognise that as one of the key findings from this report, that there isn't a broad enough suite of indicators to um, capture all aspects of, of Scottish education system. OECD report uh, comments similarly. Um, and on the, the element that relates to um, exams as well, well that, that again feels somewhat, uh, uh, perhaps not up for grabs, but if the, the level of change that's been, um, we've seen over the past couple of years and how exams have undertaken, if that then leads to further change, all the more reason that you know, if this is a reset moment to we need a new suite of indicators that measures and assesses how the Scottish education system is performing, um, particularly on the back of the, the pandemic. Now is the opportunity to do so uh, for the years to come. Um, that, but, but absolutely, we see that would be one of the, is the key finding of the report, Mr. Beatty, that there isn't enough data to have that rounded assessment of how the Scottish education system is performing. To what extent have you had discussions with the Scottish Government on this? Um, so we, we've clearly we've kind of cleared uh, the report. Um, there's a, I would say, a, a broad and emerging acceptance of the need for more data, but probably as I think as Anthony and Tricia have commented, that the Scottish government's response to both this report and also the OECD report will inform you know, their uh, their and our understanding of you know, what happens next, both in terms of the indicators um, and the clear data that supports the delivery of outcomes. Just moving on slightly to something that we've, we've already talked about um, a little bit, which is the question of exams. Uh, paragraph 42, page 22 of the report correctly says that those working in education are very much focused on children and young people's well-being as a key priority, and so it should be. Is it possible to, to measure that in any way, that uh, focus? Because, you know, so many things have happened where local authorities and the Scottish Government are trying to support young people and so on to focus on their health and well-being, ensure that they're, they're in, a, in a safe environment. Is there any way to measure that? Is there any objective view can be taken on that? Because it has taken up, obviously, a huge amount of time and resources and effort. Um, so, so you're right, there is a... There's an acceptance across the education system that this is you know, um, that, that this parity of esteem that you know, education is about more than exams, but in order to have that uh, that wider interpretation of how the system is performing, there needs to be a, you know, a wider suite of indicators that you know, that capture health and well-being, confidence of, of children and young people too. Um, I think Trisha will probably want to come in again in, in a moment just to say what we've seen in uh, both in discussions and perhaps drawn on experience elsewhere of how that's measured and the opportunities for government and the education system to, to broaden that out. Um, our sense would be, and I think this goes back to the whole planning for outcomes and, and, and data and quality of data and the outcomes that, that come from it, is that in order to do so, accepting that it's difficult and potentially challenging to do so, because I, I think I also draw a conclusion that um, if this was you know, very easy it would have been done by now, but nonetheless, you know, if if school is to shift away from being that sole focus on exams, as we see in the indicators, we have to overcome this hurdle to have that broader suite um, of indicators. Um, but I invite Trisha just to say a word or two more about kind of what we've seen and the experience that we can draw on. Thank you. 
Um, so one of the, the indicators in the National Improvement Framework is around health and wellbeing, um, and that is based on some survey data. So it's not seeing what we see as the exam data, which is based on, on every, every um, children and young person. Um, so the survey data, I think, was most recently from the Scottish Health Survey. So it's about 2019 or so. So there is a bit of a lag, and it's obviously on a, on a survey basis and on a very specific set of questions that are included in the health survey. We do know that work was going on prior to COVID around improving the, the data around health and wellbeing that could then feed into the National Improvement Framework. That had started and was then paused because of the impact of, of COVID. So we're waiting to see what happens with that being picked up to, to see how we can um, get to that more, more rounded data set. We know obviously there's work going on within individual schools, within individual councils as well. One of the one of the NIF drivers is around using data to really understand your your own pupils and their own circumstances. And we saw a number of examples where that was really happening and, and the, the schools, the councils had were using that information to really understand the, the, the circumstances of their pupils, be that in relation to things like well being as well, and to be tar to be targeting to their support to those pupils, around approaches to nurture, things like that as well. So we know that there is there's a handle on this at, at a local level within schools and within within um, councils in terms of their own priorities. It isn't yet reflected in terms of national data. There has been some work started and then paused by COVID and we're waiting to see what will, what will happen when that work restarts around getting some better national data. But at the moment it is quite quite a gap um, and other issues around confidence. We, we haven't seen how that's going to be taken forward and that is one of the the four capacities of curriculum for excellence, so you would expect again to be able to know if things like that are actually happening and being delivered. Just one last uh, question on this. Um, we've already highlighted that uh, in questioning that uh, there's a disparity in the indicators in respect to the prominence of exam performance versus uh, the wider outcomes. and. You know, in your report, you make it clear that the Scottish Government and local authorities should be working together to ensure there's more prominence given to that uh, to that balance. Is there any indication that is actually happening at the moment? Um, you're right. Again, I'm going, to, I'm going to maybe hand straight to Anthony actually just to kind of update the committee. But it's, it's a very clear recommendation that we make about is to broadening out the the, the tone and. Um, and measures and language we use about school and measuring success, that it covers all of those, those wider indicators and those broader pathways about the, how children and young people feel about themselves and the experience that they get from school education and how that's measured. But I'll pass to Anthony. Mr Beattie, can update the committee. Yes, Mr Beattie, it was very clear when we were doing our audit work that there was an acceptance within government at national and local level. This is something that needs to happen. And you'll recall that the OECD report makes a very similar conclusion and draw to, to the one we, we did in our report, in that it, it concluded, I think, that as you get into this senior phase of the school, um, I think, I think, from the ambitions of curriculum for excellence in terms of its wider outcomes. So there is genuinely, a, I think, a commitment and an awareness and a willingness to make this change, change happen at both national and local level. I would be very surprised if that isn't one of the key key actions that flows from the Scottish Government's response to the OECD report. Okay. Thank you, Mira. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in um, Sharon Dowie back in, and uh, I think Willie Coffey's also got um, a question in the area that Sharon's pursuing. So, Sharon. Okay, hi again. The Scottish Attainment Challenge, supported by the Scottish Attainment Fund, is designed to reduce inequality in education. However, in paragraph 74 of the report, page 31, Audit Scotland note that the SAF does not fully reflect broader demographic issues, specifically mentioning rural communities. What improvements do you feel could be made to the SAF to reflect the inequalities mentioned in paragraph 74? Thank you. I'll, um, I'll happily say words and, and invite Zoe to come back and actually say a little bit more about um, what options exist. Um, the, the background to the, um, the, the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the, the Attainment Scotland funding uh, was to tackle uh, the attainment gap that existed between Scotland's most deprived 
and least deprived uh, uh, communities and children and young people in education. And the funding that, that, uh, that came from that was based on identification of nine attainment challenge authorities in Scotland, which had the greatest concentration of um, instance of multiple deprivation as identified by the SIMD, the Scottish Instance of Multiple Deprivation Factors, with, with um, the quartiles one and two. So that set out the nine authorities and that led to the, the funding that flowed from them. Um, the, there are critics of that approach, Ms Dowie, and, and, and certainly that came across in the conversations that, that we were having with um, education practitioners during our, our audit work, that it was, I think as you allude to, perhaps too blunt a tool with which to allocate funding, in that it didn't sufficiently address where there was a, uh, perhaps not so much pockets, but a wide dispersal of um, poverty in, in rural areas, as factors, where there were in a generally affluent local authority, but again, that there were, there were pockets of deprivation in there, but it wasn't reflected in the overall profile of the local authority. Um, so that led to suggestions that there, there may be better ways of doing this, and particularly looking at the, the funding announcement that happened over the summer, that there'll be a further £1 billion of funding made available through the um, Attainment Challenge Fund, is that other, other mechanisms that can do so. And it isn't that there are some safeguards in the current measure, so there's some direct funding to schools um, over and above the, the, the total council area that, that attempts to allow for some of those disparities. But the feedback that we received from, from education providers was that, that didn't do it sufficiently and at risk it was too blunt a tool to address uh, where there were uh, pockets of deprivation or particular features of a local authority that weren't sufficiently measured in the overall SIMD targets. Um, so we, again, capturing that in, in the report, that the need for a wider look and say that are there different tools with funding could be allocated to close the poverty-related attainment gap. I'll invite Zoe just to come in if there's anything more she wishes to say on this topic. Um, thank you very much. Yes, as the Auditor General said, I think there, there was a feeling um, with the report that the SIMG was just didn't quite capture the, the spread and, and of, of, um, of deprivation. Um, we did some, some field work in our, in our first set of work around up in, uh, up in Shetland, and there was very much a feeling that because as the SIMG is measured by postcode, once you look at a rural area, that can cover such a, a wide area, so it really doesn't reflect necessarily the, the deprivation in those rural areas. And as the Auditor General said, sometimes you have more affluent areas, but there are small pockets within that of, of, people, of deprivation, and they're not necessarily always being targeted. Um, I suppose another thing to think about as well um, now, um, we are of course in the midst of the pandemic, is actually how um, that's affected deprivation levels, and, and there may be some families that now are in a different position than they were um, you know, previously when the SIMG was put forward. So I think that has to be, to be brought out as well in terms of, of any more funding and how that's targeted in, in the future. To make sure we're, the money's following the child. Opportunity. The post -code, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, more opportunity to think about other, you know, in, in review of the um, Attainment Challenge Fund allocations and if, you know, if there's a wider consideration of indicators um, and particularly with the significance of the sums that again have been allocated to you know, are there alternative ways that, that might better target children and young people over and above the ways that have been used to date? Thanks. Uh, Willie Coffey, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks very much again, convener. Just on this agenda, the inequality agenda, Stephen, I mean, your, your report is good. It, it, it's recognising that the gap has narrowed. That's quite clear and that's to be welcome and commend the local authorities and particularly those in that group of nine that have made these efforts to, to begin to close the gap. But you then go on to say it needs to happen more quickly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to want, want to ask you, what are your views and recommendations about how that can happen more quickly? Sometimes I think, convener, that if the education system is doing and has done the best it can in the circumstances that they found themselves in, how on earth can we do this? more quickly. Um, you also mentioned that there's a further billion pounds coming down the line to help here. So do you get the sense that the government is listening to your messaging that we need to think smarter, clever, differently about how we deploy these funds to, to try to reach those communities that you mentioned a wee while ago, and I think Tricia and uh, Zoe mentioned as well. Do we need to 
to, to shape and think about how we deploy this funding in a, in a much better way to get that quicker turnaround that you hope for. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll start, Mr Coffey, and I'm sure Antony wants to say a word or two as well about uh, the local authorities' um, role in this. Uh, I think really, as you set out in your question, really, uh, that a number of the factors as to how this might uh, be achieved and, and building on the conversation we've had already this morning about the quality of data, the wider suite of indicators. Um, and we would also recognise that progress has been made. So the attainment gap on a national basis has narrowed. Um, and yet we still see a wide variation of performance looking across uh, councils themselves. So we think it's all these things about uh, the quality of the indicators, good quality data to measure the intended outcomes, building on good practice as well. You know, we, one of the recommendations that we point in the, the report is that there are many examples across the country of where um, interventions, high quality education has taken place, but the, the fairly new role of the regional improvement collaboratives, sharing out that expertise uh, across country, whatever uh, happens in future with um, Scotland's education bodies will have a, a clear role to play too. Um, the inspection approach that Scotland takes to education as well will also play a, a significant role in driving forward improvement. So unfortunately, as ever, there is, there is no one single answer uh, to this. COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, exacerbated it, you know, the, the impact that that's had on Scotland's children and young people and the need. And probably one that we, we don't shy away from, the, 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 that sense of urgency that um, very significant period of time um, has passed and huge plans for further investment that I think you know, we all probably have a right to expect that that will lead to that step change that probably we haven't seen in, in this report that's been you know, fairly marginal improvements and below the government's own ambitions. So the government set, um, well, in the conversation that my colleagues and I have had with um, government officials about stretch aims, stretch aims are a good thing. You know, they're, they're right to be demanding targets, um, but they'll be based in ambition. And I guess it's to sustain that level of ambition that, you know, um, for all the things I guess we spoke about at the start of the conversation, that you know, 10 years post Christie, if this is one of the changes that Scotland can make as a country, um, then we should be right to be ambitious. But it isn't easy, and nor would I suggest that there will be a range of components towards the making the, the change that um, is before us. Um, I hope that's kind of, I've kind of rough ended up. I'm sure Anthony will want to say a word or two more. The, the Auditor General is ab absolutely right. I mean, this is not an easy and straightforward thing. Um, and there will be debates about whether or not the pace of improvement was sufficiently fast. Uh, Avi was that the progress that was made, including the attainment gap, fell quite a bit short of what the Scottish Government had committed to. And, that, and you will have gathered that from the report. As the Auditor General says, there's not one single thing that, that, that needs to happen here. It is partly about leadership. It's partly about data. It's partly about practice within schools. But I'd also refer back to the comments that Tricia made earlier. This isn't just about schools. This is about the life circumstances of children and families that can contribute to better long-term outcome. Because it's obviously been a, a terrible and tragic event for, 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 for many people across Scotland. It's been something that no one can think of as being a positive thing. But I think it has shone a, a real spotlight on the issue of inequalities in ways that we haven't had for many, many decades. And the strong sense we're getting is that Scottish Government, local government and others are really wanting to, to build that issue of focusing on addressing inequalities into their recovery planning. So that's not just about education recovery, it's about economic recovery, it's about health recovery. And I think if people do have a, what you might call a joined up approach to COVID-19 recovery that places equalities at, at the center, one would hope, I think, that we might see some more rapid progress in closing the attainment gap as a consequence of that. Mm. Okay. That's, that's really helpful. Thanks very much, Convener. Thank you. Thanks, Willie. Um, I'm now going to turn to um, Craig Hoy, who's got a series of questions, but I think you want, Craig, to uh, make a declaration of interest before you put your questions. Yes, if I could just draw the committee's attention to uh, my register of interests, which obviously details me as a member of the East Lothian Council uh, Education Committee. Um, good morning, uh, Mr Boyle. Um, I think it's uh, commonly and widely accepted that uh, poverty and inequality are very stubborn stains on, on the fabric of modern S Scotland. And you said uh, in relation to COVID in, in your opening remarks 
that those living in the most challenging circumstances would be hit uh, hardest um, uh, uh, by, by COVID. In paragraph 87 uh, of uh, the report, you speak of the need for the Scottish Government and councils and also their partners to fully understand the impact of COVID-19 on all young people and request that they gather the relevant data if they are to support the development of appropriate uh, responses. Are you satisfied with the action that has been taken uh, to date uh, in relation to this? Are we, um, good morning, Mr. Uh, we, in the report, refer to a number of steps that have been taken, um, none of which will be complete um, yet as to sufficiently assessing both the impact of COVID-19 on, on children and young people, nor the steps that it identifies that to, to address that. I think it probably builds on the conversation that we've just had with uh, Mr. Coffey about the, the range of steps that will need to flow uh, on the back of the, the pandemic. Um, we refer to one in, in the report that the, the equity audit that the Scottish Government undertook, and there'll no doubt be similar uh, activity that's taking place across the country to assess the impact that the pandemic is having, both on you know, the range of indicators um, and the need for a broader suite of indicators, and especially the volume of public spending that will be allocated to education, uh, both in the, the £1 billion that we've mentioned in the, the Attainment Challenge Fund, but the, the very significant component of local authority budgets that education makes up, that that money is, is well spent, is sufficiently targeted, whether it's using the existing SIMD indicators or whether there's other mechanisms. Um, so I can't probably give you the assurance that I think you're asking for this morning as to whether all of the steps um, have been taken. I think that was something that you know, through uh, our work on a national basis and the work of uh, um, that we undertake in local authorities and fundamentally the work that uh, councils and their partners themselves take to assess the impact and uh, develop the necessary plans. But it's work that we'll continue to return to. Just over the last um, 18 months, um, councils and particularly the education departments have been working around the clock both to uh, set up hybrid learning and, and, and distance online learning and then to get in-classroom learning back up and running again. Do you think that councils have got sufficient resource to compile this relevant data or is this something that could be lost in the scramble to get ed education back up and running again? I, I'm pretty quickly just going to hand over to Anthony Clark given his uh, role as the Interim Director of Proms Audit and Best Value but importantly the Controller of Audit and his closeness to how well councils are responding. I, th I think you're quite right Mr. Hoy. There, there is a risk around, around this aspect of um, restarting the education system, but the sense we've got from our engagement with local authorities, from our engagement with the Association of Directors of Education Services, is that schools have been doing a, a really sterling effort in understanding the circumstances of different children and what support they need, both in terms of the hybrid setting and also thinking through what additional support those children might need moving forward as we shift into the education recovery phase. Um, so I, I think we're, we're broadly confident that this is, this is happening at the moment. Um, so, yes, I think we're probably confident this is happening at the moment, Mr Hoy. And just in follow-up to that, obviously gathering the data and, and compiling the evidence of what's happened is, is one thing, but implementing um, a series of measures so that we avoid bad outcomes is obviously another. This is not as if we're trying to compile that data to learn lessons should we see COVID occur again in the future. It's to deal with the damage that has obviously taken place now. So have you got sufficient assurance that actually we're going to see this journey through to the end and that there will be measurable uh, 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 implementation of different initiatives to make sure that we, 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 we tackle the worst of COVID on particularly vulnerable children? I don't think I can give you that assurance, Mr Hoy. But what I can give the assurance is that, that all the people we're engaging with in the system are committed to making that happen. But only time will tell whether or not it will be successful. Okay. And just um, your report is, explains that improving outcomes um, for children and young people through school education requires the, the contribution of wider stakeholders, health, social work and, and the third sector, and that the COVID-19 Children and Families Collective Leadership Group was established in May 2020, uh, which will help to provide scope to build on a future cross-sector uh, uh, collaboration. How important in improving outcomes is the contribution of, of these wider stakeholders and, and, and why? 
I'm, I'm happy to start actually I'm, I'm sure Anthony and perhaps also Zoe will want to comment on what we've seen um, we do think it's very important that you know, the, the, it's, and it's something that we've commented in a number of areas with the importance of uh, the community contribution uh, to the achievement of outcomes working closely uh, across partnerships as we touched on the report in your question health councils um, and the, the fact that the school community involves many different uh, contributors and I think probably actually broadens out to the um, the wider school experience that there will be many different pathways whether it's through skills modern apprenticeships and those start at an earlier stage they don't start at the moment that a young person leaves school there'll be access to different um, providers and opportunities um, to to lead to that kind of post school experience so it's it's hugely important especially on the back of COVID, that, that sense of this is a collective effort, that collaborative leadership to deliver better outcomes uh, for Scotland's children and young people. Um, and maybe turn to Anthony and I think perhaps also Zoe, just to say a, a little bit more about um, that collaborative leadership and how that's working. Uh, thank you. Uh, as the Auditor General says, this, this is a hugely important area, Mr Hoy. I mean, we, we know that the local authorities, educational authorities, have for many, many years been working in partnership with health, the third sector, police and others to try and provide, if you like, joined up support for children and their learning. We also know that, that schools are an important part of this, but not the whole story. We made that point earlier. I would just and if you think about the, the different needs of children, they're all individuals. Some children have additional support needs. Some children have special support that might need to be required. That's not always best delivered by a school. It can often be best delivered by the third sector or, or a charity. So that makes it all the more important that there's effective joint working between the education authority, the school and their partners in the local area. We also need to think about the broader things that can contribute to good outcomes for young children. You know, decent housing, having food on the table, you know, stable employment in their families. That for me also reinforces the importance of education being situated in the wider context of the community. So I'm, I'm very much in agreement with your Auditor on this. I'm sure Trisha, I'm sure Zoe may have something to add to this as well. Though. Thanks very much. I, I just add my agreement really with them um, the, and, and just say, I suppose, within our field work, the, the first set of work we did when we went out to, to councils, really did see on the ground the um, the effect that um, third sector organisations had to improving young people's outcomes and could really target um, certain young people and, and understand their needs. And uh, the, the taking that real kind of um, holistic approach around around the school and around that, that child to understand what it is that they need. So some, some just really good positive examples of, of where the, the third sector in particular um, really helped contribute to that. And just um, finally, obviously, the um, Children and Families Group was set up in addition to the COVID-19 Education Re uh, Recovery Group. How effectively do you think these groups, and specifically the uh, Children and Families Collective Leadership Group, is in sharing and highlighting good practice? And have you as yet got any indication of whether or not that good practice is then finding its way through to um, measurable and implementable um, solutions? I, I suspect it might be too early to draw any firm conclusions. Again, again, I'll invite Zoe to say a word or two more, but I think given the... We've commented in the round that, that these groups responded quickly. They were broad representation from um, across uh, interested parties and that they um, were all making best endeavours to kind of share um, good practice, collective leadership um, across the country. How successful that will be probably feels it's going to be something that we'll want to return to. And the group themselves, of course, will, will want to turn to, to make assessments of the impact um, of their contribution. Um, so we remain on our radar, Mr Hoy, but um, I think at the moment it's probably a little bit early to draw conclusions. But again, I invite Zoe to say if there's anything more she wishes to add. Thank you. Um, I think that's all I had. I just echo that, yeah, it, it, it's a little bit too early to draw those conclusions. And, and also to add into to the mix around, you know, it, it's also for, for regional improvement cloud collaboratives and, and education authorities and through through ADES, um associate directors of education to, to come together to help to share that good practice as well. Thanks very much. 
Thanks very much. Can I end then just with um, a couple of questions about the money? Because um, as I read the report, and if I read it correctly, uh, the report seems to conclude that whilst um, overall total national e education spending on schools rose between 2013-14 and 2018-19 uh, by 0.7% in real terms, Within that, there was quite a bit of variation, and I think one of the things that struck me uh, that the report uh, concluded was that uh, in those uh, councils that were targeted for Attainment Scotland funding, there was quite a variation there too. And so, for example, again, keep me right if I'm wrong on this, but, but my understanding is that with the exception of Glasgow City Council, um, all of those Attainment Challenge councils saw a drop uh, in that period in um, educational spending, if you exclude the um, Attainment Scotland funding. Now, I thought that the Attainment Scotland funding was meant to be additional to tackle uh, a particular problem, but, so I wonder whether you've got any uh, reflections on that, comments on that, and um, you know, whether you've got a view about what that impact was on those councils where in uh, their kind of... Uh, mainstream operational spending, there was a reduction in their budget. Thank you, Convener. I'll, I'll hand to Anthony in a moment or two. I think I would maybe comment in, in overall terms. Um, I think your analysis is right that sp spending on Scottish education increased from £4.1 billion to £4.3 billion pounds, um, and the 0.7% in, in real terms figure that you mentioned. Um, part of the money, of course, really is the Attainment Challenge um, funding. And one of the aspects that, that came out, perhaps to, to highlight in, from our report, is that the, the, the doubt about the durability of that subsequently confirmed that it's, that it's been extended and how that impacted upon, upon spending, the sustainability, and, and something that both ourselves and Education Scotland found in their work. Um, so the sustainability of the funding, I guess, matters uh, also, in, in the, and then the associated effectiveness of it. It's always the case of the a sense of that money is going to be available for a short time, that will influence the choices and the spending patterns that both you know, councils and schools, especially given the nature of this funding, much of it was devolved to for um, individual head teachers to determine. So we would recognise all of those factors about the, the need for both a sustainable funding model in the Scottish education system and also the impact that the Attainment Challenge funding had on the overall picture uh, through the course of the period that we looked at. But I'm going to hand over to, to Anthony just to explore that a little bit further about the, how that interacted with Council's overall education spending. Thank you. Yes, Mr Lender, you've interpreted the report quite correctly. Um, what, what, we, what we saw in the report, I think, was really quite a mixed and variable pattern of education investment by, by local authorities, whether they were attainment challenge authorities or non-attainment challenge authorities. It's really a, a matter of local policy choice, I think, to an extent. Uh, how local authorities choose to invest in education, social work, housing or, or other services. Um, but we did see variability across the piece. There is an open question, I think, about the effectiveness of the attainment challenge funding. Um, the evaluation work, I think, presents a slightly mixed picture there. The feedback from head teachers and others that are using the fund, but as you'll see from the report, we haven't seen that uh, filtering through to improved education outcomes using the relatively narrow measure of exam results at this point. Thank you, and uh, I'll come back to that point in, in a minute. But I just wanted to ask as well um, about uh, something else which is covered in your report, and uh, it would have been very fresh at the time of the report, and uh, we've now got some benefit of um, uh, a slightly longer view of it, and that was the, the, the money that was set aside to help the logistics of schools reopening at the start of the year. Um, I think there was £50 million additional funding allocated uh, to, to help schools reopen safely. Uh, and at the time, as I recall it, um, uh, local councillors were saying this was insufficient to, uh, to do what we need to do. And I think at the time, the Scottish Government said it is sufficient. I just wonder whether you've had a, an opportunity to review that and to see um, if somebody was right and somebody was wrong. So we recognise the debate convener that took place at the time, the £50 million funding and, and the commentary uh, from places that that wouldn't be enough to cover all of what was required. 
Um, we've also seen, I think, over the course of the summer since the report was published, that additional funding has been made available to, uh, to support some of the, the reopening requirements. Um, whether that allows us to draw a conclusion that, that one party was right and another was wrong, I'm, I'm not sure we're, we're able to do so, but perhaps to recognise the, the complexity and the, the additional funding that has flowed and, and also probably the ongoing costs around additional cleaning, PPE that's still being made available um, and the, the need for any kind of choices and policy choices that about uh, the funding environment for individual schools and councils. We'll probably have to factor all of these kind of COVID-related safety measures for a good while yet. Um, yes, I think um, I think that's that's so. Can I just then finally turn to because you've mentioned it on a number of occasions in this morning's session, the one billion pounds announced over the summer, uh, which um, is a presumably a commitment by the Scottish government to, uh, at least for the term of this Parliament, uh, keep investing in. Uh, uh, mechanisms for closing the attainment gap. Um, do you know, I mean, is that additional money uh, over and beyond the core funding for education delivered by uh, local government? Uh, and secondly, again, this is something which has been a thread running through uh, our uh, conversations, um, is about not just where things go wrong, but where things go right. Do you know, what sense do you get of uh, a sharing of good practice, a sharing of things that work using this uh, funding, because there are clearly uh, certain stipulations about what it can and cannot be spent on, uh, which led to some uh, very innovative ideas, especially in the early days of its in introduction. I just wonder whether you get a sense that there is uh, a collaboration, sharing of good practice, and that is then helping to inform uh, if there's going to be an additional, if it is additional billion pounds in the system, uh, whether that's going to be well spent and provide value for money and have the effect that's desired. Thanks, convener. Actually, I'll, uh, I'll cover part of your question, my response, and uh, invite colleagues. And Zoe may be best place to comment on the extent of collaboration uh, that's taking place across uh, councils. Um, undoubtedly, I mean, I think as we touched in the report that. Um, there are some great examples of how this money has been used um, across the country, um, the impact that it's had on children and young people. Um, but perhaps the need, and again reflected in the Education Scotland interim reports, as they've looked at uh, the success of the, uh, the Pupil Equity Fund over the course of the past few years, the need for um, those good practice examples to be um, shared more widely, for the collaboration that um, exists in the education sector to use these examples for impact. So whether it's through you know, leadership arrangements, inspection arrangements, all of those you know, serve to best effect to, to ensure that that money's been used to best, uh, to best practice. I think as we've touched on this morning is that we weren't able to draw any firm conclusions that the money had made that, that widespread difference, as is suggested by the indicators and probably the lack of uh, the widespread indicators that needs to come. And that would be one of the uh, conclusions we'd also draw is that as the government has committed to this additional £1 billion over the life of, of this parliamentary term for to close the poverty-related attainment gap, that it seizes on the opportunities that for those good practice, better indicators to support better outcomes um, as we move forward. But I'll maybe ask Zoe just to come in on some of the um, the collaboration examples and practice we've seen, and also just to address the point that you asked about the additionality factor of the budget of this money over and above local government spending. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, in terms of the, the kind of sharing of good practice, I think we did see it happening um, uh, across local authorities. And, and also I think there was a recognition um, that a lot of the spending, it was, it was more useful in terms of trying to... Um, Again, coming back to that sustainability, the sustainability of the funding. So, so where successful where projects were put in place um, to try and um, boost capacity and to try and, and boost um, around staffing and things like that, rather than specific um, objects and, and things, um, was quite successful. And, and that, and I think that information is very much shared um, across local authorities about that right idea around sustainability. Um, I might um, just pass it to my colleague Tricia just to. to around the, the 
Thank you. Yeah, that that is my understanding that that is that is additional. We know that the attainment challenge is running till till next year. We don't know what will happen beyond the attainment challenge. So, um, so we're waiting to, to kind of hear announcements on whether or not there'll be something separate that will replace it or, or how that's going to work going forward. Um, and I think just if I could come in on the, the sharing of good practice point as well, I think just, just to make the point around the role of Education Scotland there as well and, with, and working with the councils and also working with the regional improvement collaboratives. And um, so, the, so their role is very much around working with individual schools, councils, um, to be looking at what's happening, what is working, to be sharing that within their own regional improvement areas, but also across the whole organisation. So, so to be sharing that more, <clears throat> more widely and to be um, helping to roll that out um, across the system as well. So again, <clears throat> we've got recommendations in the report around Education Scotland working with their partners to, to continue to do that and really understanding what it is that's driving the improvement and understanding what's contributing to the variation as well so that again they can continue to build on good practices particularly around the, the kind of NIF um, drivers or in things like teacher professionalism and leadership and using data to understand local context so so yeah i think there's a, a, a key role for education scotland there as well okay thank you very much indeed and um on behalf of the committee, can I thank uh, Stephen Boyle, uh, his team this morning, Anthony Clark, uh, Tricia Meldrum and uh, Zoe Maguire for uh, keeping us informed and, uh, and answering uh, the questions that we put. We really appreciate uh, your time and the work that you're doing. And can I draw the public part of this morning's committee to an end? <laughs>